Hello friends, this is Dennis Calhoun of the Old North Church in Marblehead, Massachusetts. We are an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. And no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. As always, we're delighted that you're worshiping with us. We'll be celebrating communion this week, so if you haven't already rounded up a bit of bread and something to drink as we commemorate the Lord's Supper, I encourage you to hit pause and do so now. We'll wait. You know, it's been 14 months since we've been able to gather in person here in this sanctuary, but things are changing. We're now worshiping together at the Marblehead Lighthouse, as long as it's not raining, at 8 a.m. every Sunday morning. We certainly hope to see you there as spring gives way to summer. But if you can't join us at Chandler Hovey Park, you can continue to watch our virtual worship services on YouTube and Facebook each week. We're so fortunate to have a dedicated host of volunteers, along with our church staff, who've spent hours each week bringing you worship services that we hope you've found meaningful. We are deeply grateful by, for all the work done by so many. I'm personally grateful for my colleague, Lindsay Popperson, and her film editing skills, and for all of you who've contributed videos and still photographs for her to work into the lovely visual montages to go along with music coordinated by our Minister of Music, Maria Van Kalken. Thanks to Stephanie Scarcella and Holly Cameron, our vocal soloists, who along with a number of guest musicians have graced us with their gifts each week. Thanks as well to our Board of Deacons under the leadership of Frank Ahrens, who've been part of the service each week. And of course, our heartfelt thanks to Chris Van Raymortel, who has been our tireless and ever patient film editor for these past 14 months. Thanks to all of them for all they've done to make possible for us to worship together even when we could not be together. Now that we're gathering at the Lighthouse each week, we'll be filming the service out there and offering it on our YouTube and Facebook channels. The service will have a different look and feel than what we've been doing, we hope you'll be blessed by it. Full disclosure, we had intended to post last week's Lighthouse service in this space this week, but between the gale force wind out there and a host of technical glitches, that didn't work out. So instead, we're reposting a service from last summer. Make sense? Once you've seen what we were up against last Sunday, I think you'll see why we decided to rewind and repeat. We plan to post this week's Lighthouse service next week. Anyway, we're delighted you've joined us this week, and we hope to see you in person soon. Now, friends, let us worship our good and gracious God, shall we? In the beginning, before time, before people, before the world began, God was. Here and now, among us, beside us, enlisting the people of earth for the purposes of heaven, God is. In the future, when we have turned to dust and all we know has found its fulfillment, God will be. Not denying the world, but delighting in it. Not condemning the world, but redeeming it through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God was, God is, God will be. Hello Church, I'm Lindsay Popperson, your Associate Minister. Please, will you join me in our prayer of invocation, based on the words of Psalm 145. God, you are good to all and your compassion is over all that you have made. You uphold all who are falling and raise up all who are bowed down. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. You are just in all your ways and kind in all your doings. 
You are near to all who call on you. We call on you today, trusting in your goodness. As we pray in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus modeled for us a life of balance, work and rest, community and solitude, prayer and action. Our lives are constantly thrown off balance, and so we neglect to do what God has called us to do. Sometimes we neglect to love our neighbors as we have ourselves. Sometimes we forget the abundance that has been entrusted to us, and so we do not share as we could. Sometimes we are so hard at work that we fail to slow down and enjoy the beauty that God has prepared for us. In the silence that follows, I invite us to examine our consciences, confess our sins, lay down our shame, and receive the mercy that God is so eager to give. Beloved community, our God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. As we come to God, our spirits are restored and our lives are realigned so that we might live as Jesus lived, filling our days with prayerful action and abundant joy and rest. Thanks be to God. Good morning. My name is Karen Kilty. I'm the Director of Children's Ministries here at Old North Church. This morning's reading, we'll be hearing of the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. And I've been thinking about that this week as I think about families and I think about times around the kitchen table. Things I'd like to share with you today. One day, Jesus went out to a quiet place where there were no shops, restaurants. There were no homes. 
And in the Bible, it says it was a deserted place. When the people heard that Jesus was going to be there, they, they went after him as well. They wanted to follow and be close to him. Many walked a long time to be with Jesus. He taught them and he healed them. A crowd of more than 5,000 had gathered. And then when evening came, the disciples wanted to send everybody away. They could go walk back to the town, buy some food for themselves, they thought. But Jesus said, don't send them away. You give them something to eat. Now remember, there are no stores nearby, no restaurants in this deserted place. So the disciples were very confused. In the Gospel of John, the same story is told. And there's an extra piece that I couldn't quite stop thinking about this week as I was preparing. It goes like this. Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him. He said to Philip, where shall we buy bread to feed these people? He asked this only to test Philip, for Jesus already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him thinking, oh no, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough food to feed each of these people just one bite. Another disciple, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother spoke up, said, here is a boy with five small loaves of bread and two fish. But how far will that go among so many? There's a lot to wonder about at that moment. There were so many people in this story, Philip, Simon, Peter, Andrew, the other disciples, Jesus, the boy, and so many others who gathered that day, ones who searched for food, those who gathered with faith that day so that Jesus might heal them or teach them about hope and of God's love. So many miracles happened. And as I read this lesson and I, I was preparing, I kept thinking about the boy. What was his experience that day? Did he know what was going to happen as he walked and walked and walked to see Jesus? Was he a small boy that might have gotten lost in the crowd of 5,000? Was he with his brothers and sisters, his mom, his dad? What did his lunch bag look like? And then I thought, who made his lunch? The lunch of loaves and bread and a fish or two was the center of the miracle. The boy's mom and dad are not mentioned in the story, but the food they placed in the bag that day is the center of an old, old story, the story of one of Jesus' most special miracles. A mom and dad who packed a simple lunch for their son before he went out in the morning. They were doing what parents do, taking care of their child. The disciples didn't know how all of those people could be fed, but they did, ask, they did as Jesus had asked them. Jesus knew what he was going to do. They brought the boy and his bag of two fish and bread to him. Jesus told the people to sit down on the grass. He took the bread and the fish and prayed over it. Then he broke the fish and the bread into pieces and the disciples carried the meal to the people. Everyone ate and when they were finished, the disciples collected leftover pieces of fish and bread. They didn't waste any food. Imagine five loaves of bread, two fish, more than 5,000 people, and there were leftovers. So as I read this over and over again this week, along with our children and our children at heart, it is you moms and dads that I am especially thinking about this day. You who are tired, overworked, overwhelmed, who find yourselves wondering and worrying, hungering for answers. Remember, hold tight. You just never know the little somethings that you have left in your reserves to give. What small miracles can come from those little pieces, those little bits, those leftovers. In this time of uncertainty, I can share this with certainty that with each meal you make, story you tell, hug you give, patient you muster, you are a miracle and you are not alone. 
You are loved beyond measure, so hold tight. Imagine what it must have been like when the boy's family all could sit down together and share the story of Jesus' miracle. The boy and the bag of a simple lunch. A mother's hands kneading and baking bread. A dad who provide the fish that Jesus was able to bless and turn these special gifts from their kitchen, a simple lunch for their child, into one of the most beautiful miracles. Remember to hold tight, moms and dads, and know that there is goodness in the leftovers. For even the smallest bits, big and beautiful things can come. Will you pray with me? Holy One, abundant love, open our hearts and our eyes to see miracles in the ordinary. In these challenging times, help us to put our worries aside, even if it's only for a moment, so that we may be present to your blessings. Loaves of bread, two fish, and help us to gather what is left over and let us fill and be filled with your peace. Amen. Good morning. I'm Jill Dearborn, a deacon at Old North Church, and I'll be reading our first scripture reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 14. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away, so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Good morning. Our second reading this morning is a poem by David White entitled, Loaves and Fishes. This is not the age of information. This is not the age of information. Forget the news and the radio and the blurred screen. This is the time of loaves and fishes. People are hungry and one good word is bread for a thousand. We have heard these words from poetry. Let us find within them the voice of God. Friends, will you pray with me? O Holy One who has spoken in the past and is still speaking, speak now for we, your servant people, are listening. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Matthew tells us, and they all ate and were satisfied and they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over. Feeding the 5,000 is one of the miracle stories of Jesus we read during the season known as ordinary time in our liturgical calendar. Of course, there's nothing ordinary about feeding 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. And there's certainly nothing ordinary about this time when we're living through a global pandemic that has altered our world in ways we couldn't have imagined last time this story appeared in our liturgical calendar. 
But many of us have heard this story so often and know it so well that it may no longer strike us as extraordinary. On the other hand, those of us in the United Church of Christ are fond of saying and believing God is still speaking. So if we have ears to hear, we listen again attentively and thoughtfully. That's what we do. We have heard these words from Scripture, and we listen for a word from God. Now, it's tempting to spiritualize a story like this. Most of us are apt to interpret the story of the loaves and fishes and the feeding of the hungry crowd as metaphors for the spiritual nourishment Christ offers his followers. And there's some justification for seeing Physical food is only part of what Jesus offered those who hungered there in that remote place beside the sea. On several occasions, Jesus warned people against trying to fill themselves on bread that spoils, like the manna God provided the Hebrew people as they wandered in the wilderness. Instead, Jesus offered his followers what he called the bread of life which he said the world can neither give nor take away. The bread of life, which the world can neither give nor take away. But what bears noting in this story is that Jesus feeds the hungry crowd not with a catchy metaphor or some spiritual platitude, but with real food, loaves and fish, fish sandwiches as it were in such extravagant abundance that 12 baskets were needed to hold all that was left over. Real food in abundance for all who were hungry. That's what this story speaks of. Now the point of the story seems clear. It is not the will of God that people go hungry. People must have food to eat if they are to love and serve the God who breathed them into being. What kind of God is glorified when people are left hungry? The message of the gospel must never be seen as a substitute for the fundamental physical needs for human survival. So this story is about people being fed, fed with the bread of life that nourished their souls, yes, but also with bread and fish, the proteins and fats and carbohydrates that kept their bodies healthy and alive. But more than that, this is a story about the way Jesus drew on the power of God to multiply what little food they had so that everyone was able to eat and be satisfied. It is the power of God on display in this story, the power of love and compassion that God revealed, a power as miraculous now as it was the day when 5,000 hungering souls discovered that when the power of God was at work, there is more than enough to nourish both body and soul. I've witnessed miracles like these. I bet you have too. Some years ago, we were in New York with our niece who was visiting from Wisconsin. Like lots of visitors to New York that summer, she said she'd like to visit Ground Zero. So we took the subway down to Lower Manhattan. Lots of people still felt drawn there after the terrorist attack of 9-11, long after the rubble from the World Trade Center had been completely cleared away. I wonder about the appeal of some of the sites in and around biblical Jerusalem. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, for example, places that look nothing like they did when the events which made them hallowed ground actually took place. Visiting Ground Zero gave me some insight into that. There's a sense that the ground is hallowed, and being there somehow connects the visitor to something very big and very, very powerful. I was surprised by the emotions I felt as we walked with our niece along the street in front of St. Paul's Chapel 
at the corner of Church and Vesey Streets in Lower Manhattan. It's one of the places where, even years after the attack, crowds continue to visit in reverent silence. Caught up in the enormity of the human loss represented by the thousands of mementos left in memory of those who perished there. A block in either direction, the sidewalks were lined with the stalls of the money changers, doing a brisk business in photographs and posters and t-shirts and all manner of memorabilia emblazoned with the letters NYPD and FDNY and the words, September 11th, we will never forget. But there in front of the St. Paul's Chapel, a serene and respectful silence prevailed. The power of it was overwhelming. As I moved along slowly down the sidewalks with the crowd, I remembered spending 10 or 12 hours on that same spot just Seven days after the attack in 2001, I was there as a volunteer fire department chaplain. The pile of rubble was still smoldering then, and there were thousands of rescue and recovery workers working feverishly around the clock. At the time, everyone on the site was driven by the vanishing hope of finding survivors and the grim task of recovering bodies. And back then, just a week after the attack, the chaos of the first few days was only beginning to give way to any kind of order. What was happening was still an outpouring of the spirit of camaraderie and common cause that had the entire nation in its gripped grip in the midst of a tragedy no one had imagined a week before. We'd come down about 20 of us from the church I was serving at the time to volunteer at St. Paul's Chapel. Our mission was primarily to offer food and drink and whatever comfort we could for those who were doing the unspeakably grim work of looking for bodies amidst the rubble. We'd come with literally thousands of sandwiches and cookies and bottled drinks from people back home who wanted to do whatever they could to help. We heard that they had been running out of food and drinks for the rescue workers. I'm not sure anyone have, would have thought of it at the time, but I'd like to think we were responding to the charge Jesus gave his disciples in our gospel lesson when he said about the hungry crowd, don't send them away. You give them something to eat. There was still no electricity in the area for refrigeration or cooking at Ground Zero, so food had to be brought in ready to eat. The day before we arrived, word got out that they couldn't feed all the rescue workers. By the end of the day, semi-trailers full of donations were being turned away. There was simply no place to store all the food and drinks that had started pouring in from everywhere. There was a spirit hovering over the entire nation at that time, a spirit, I'm sad to say, much different than the spirit hovering over our nation now. The story of the loaves and fishes was going through my head as I stood on the sidewalk in front of St. Paul's Chapel with our niece a year later, remembering how food and drink seemed to multiply by the minute there amidst the rubble at Ground Zero that September. I was overcome with emotion at the memory of what I think of as a miracle in how people came together and community was born in the midst of that terrible crisis. All of us have experienced that kind of miracle. So often it seems to happen around food. There's a crisis of some kind, a death, a disaster, an unexpected emergency. We're thrown together by some event that interrupts our routines and triggers the compassion of the people around us. Sooner or later, as if by some unspoken summons, a casserole arrives. Then a tray of lasagna, a loaf of bread, a plate of cookies. 
pretty soon the refrigerator and freezer are full and we're sending visitors home with food. We've all been on both sides of that story, in the giving and the receiving. Now, I don't mean to explain away the miracle of the loaves and fishes by suggesting it was the result of some kind of spontaneous potluck dinner that happened when this crowd of 5,000 suddenly felt a surge of compassion for one another and shared the food they had been hoarding for themselves. No, the story makes it fairly clear that those loaves and fishes were multiplied when Jesus took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples to distribute to the crowd. How could that be? Who knows? But why ask? The point is, as Scripture says, they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. For me, there is a connection between the miracle of the loaves and fishes, and the miracle of all that food at ground zero, and the miracle of the casseroles and three bean salads that appear when a loved one dies, or a big storm strikes, or like now, when a pandemic leads to the worst economic downturn since records have been kept. The miracle is that when a crisis strikes, the love and compassion of Christ are made manifest, and the bread of life is shared in and with the fish and the peanut butter sandwiches and the trays of lasagna and the plates of brownies that miraculously appear where people are hungry and in need. How does it happen? I don't know. I suppose there are lots of ways to explain these miracles of loaves and fishes. But why bother? When we are swept up in the abundant grace of God, when we are offered food for our souls along with the bread for our bellies, when we are surrounded by the extravagant outpouring of God's compassion and grace, why not simply take with both hands and don't look back? If we eat and are satisfied, why ask, how did this miracle happen? Why not just give thanks and share the feast? Isn't that the way we ought to respond to God's abundant goodness? By giving thanks and sharing what we've been given? And when we are fed, body and soul, through the miracle that is the love and compassion of Christ, how can we not turn and help feed our brothers and sisters in need? The World Health Organization recently estimated that one-third of the world is well-fed, one-third is underfed, and one-third is starving. That was before the coronavirus struck. In the 15 minutes that have passed since we heard the gospel story of the loaves and fishes, 200 people have died of starvation around the world. How can this be? How can our souls possibly find rest in a world where every year 15 million children die of hunger-related causes? This morning, as our souls are fed through our communion in the Spirit of Christ, we need to remember not only that Jesus fed the hungry crowd on the hillside with loaves and fishes, but that by his act of sharing, he was revealed to the crowd as God's message, God's manifestation of compassion and love. As we share the bread and cup of Christ's love and compassion, may we each and all be reminded that his work is now our work to feed a hungering world through the miracle that provides more than enough. Let us, the people of God, share the feast. Then let us, the people of God, provide the feast for those in need. Shall we pray? 
Holy One, source of life and love, we look to you not only as our great example, but also as our constant companion. We have come hungry for the blessing of seeing ourselves and our world from your divine perspective. When we cannot see beyond the problems of the present, when our future looks bleak, when we find ourselves anxious and dispirited, you remind us that we are blessed, that we are your beloved, that we are created in your image and are precious to you. O oh God, in these turbulent times, we pray for the healing of our nation. We are divided by our passions and opinions. We pray for patience and understanding and goodwill toward one another as we seek to face and meet the great challenges of our times. We pray for our political leaders, that they may have the wisdom and courage and humility to exercise their power and authority for the good of us all. We pray most especially that peace and justice will prevail in our world and that people and nations in this world of yours will abandon the hatred and violence that has become the means of settling our differences. Oh God, we are especially mindful of the great needs of the people we see all around us, the sick and the dying, the poor and the oppressed, those who grieve and face life without hope. We cannot name them all, but we can name those closest to our hearts. So hear our prayers for them and for all those who are nameless to us, but known to you. O oh God, let us not shrink from your call. Keep us faithful and keep us strong and keep us clear of all that draws us away from you. Wrap us in your embrace that we might experience your power and presence and know that we are blessed. All of this we pray in the blessed name and spirit of Jesus Christ. Amen. The disciples doubted that what they had would be enough to meet the needs of the world around them. We fear that too, especially with so much need now. But I am confident that the God who used five loaves and two fishes to feed thousands can use our gifts to meet the hungers of our community and our world. Thank you for your generous offerings to our shared ministry at Old North Church. If you'd like to make an online donation, we would be so grateful. And information on how to do that is in the video notes. Let us pray to dedicate all these gifts to God. God of increase and bounty, there is a certain kind of magic that happens when we share what we have. What looks so measly in our own pockets is world-changing when combined with so many other gifts. May our acts of giving bring about change change in our lives, changes in the lives we touch, changes in the systems that harm. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Beloved ones, in a time where so much has changed, rituals ground us in what doesn't change. God's love for us and God's presence in our daily lives. We celebrate this sacrament of communion and remember that nothing 
not COVID-19, not shelter in place orders, not even death can separate us from God's love. Joining me today once again to celebrate communion is my wife, Ashley, who is a UCC pastor in Norwell. Take a moment now to gather your elements and set your table. Bring a bit of bread or an English muffin or some Cheez-Its or a tortilla chip. Get a glass of wine or juice or coffee or water. Put out a tablecloth or a napkin on your kitchen counter or your coffee table or your picnic blanket. Light a candle. Gather yourself for the meal that connects us to Jesus and to all the faithful ones throughout history and to each other. setting God again and again. You call our hungry hearts to you and you give us what we need. You created a world of joyful, beautiful abundance and you made us in your image and planted us in that world alongside every creeping thing, every flying bird, every splashing whale and fish. You called us to treat this world and one another well. You called us to share and to live in equity. We got greedy and vengeful and scared. We became hoarders of things, of wealth, of grace. You spoke to us through prophets who told of your abundant love, but we ignored them. You sent Jesus to live among us to share our brokenness and lead us to wholeness. He sat down at tables where the unwelcomed were welcomed in, where the powerful were humbled and taught. He empowered his followers to share what they have so that all might have enough. And on his last night, he gathered his friends around a table for a meal. And he took the bread that was on the table and he blessed it and he broke it. And he passed it around saying, take, eat, this is my body breaking for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after dinner was over, he poured out another glass of wine and he blessed it and he passed it to them saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink of it, remember me. Remembering Christ's life and death, proclaiming his resurrection, and anticipating his return in glory, join us in reaching out your hands over your communion elements as we pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Bless this bread and bless this fruit of the vine. Bless, Bless all of us in our eating and drinking at this table, that our hearts may be opened, and that we may recognize the risen Christ in our midst, in each other, and in all for whom Christ died. This is holy food for holy people. I invite you now to partake of this sacrament. Actually, this is the bread of life broken for you. Gratitude, 
let us pray. God of abundance, you fed thousands of people in a field with two loaves and five fish. You feed our community now, bringing us comfort and grace and community as we take communion in our own homes. Thank you for offering yourself to us and binding us together with your love in the presence of the risen Christ. Amen. And now may the peace of God that goes beyond all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of Jesus Christ, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, and the blessing of our bountiful God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer be with you now and abide with you forever. Amen.